is only secondary. Above all, our speaking serves another goal, which is the modulation of corporeal jouissance. But the impact of la langue on the body does not induce harmony. It reiterates the discord that is inherent to jouissance. In Lacan's view, la, la langue functions like an ulcer. It is a parasite, he says, a veneer, a form of cancer that afflicts the human being. These are all quotes. On the one hand, la langue, so to speak, eats away aspects of jouissance and has an effect on the affected body. And now a quote from um, seminar 22. La langue, he says, no matter which element of la langue is a strand of jouissance. Therefore, its roots expand that far in the body. End of quote. To the best or to the worst, la langue has an impact on our corporeality. Yet on the other hand, it also depletes the body. In the concluding session of a seminar 21, Le Nom du Père, Lacan says that for one thing, la langue damages corporal jouissance, but at the same time, it introduces diversification and variability in the body qua living corpus of flesh. To express the weight of senseless la langue, Lacan, in his later work, argues that the isolated status of the signifier is more fundamental than its connectedness in the signifying chain. Beyond its being included in a series of words, the signifier occupies a solitary position. It makes up, he says, a one. Translated in his formal language, this means that the S1 all alone overrules the link between S1 and S2. The S1 qua isolated signifier in la langue has such a status of a one because of its link with jouissance. In terms of his classic distinction between the maternal function and the paternal function, Lacan attributes language to the mother and more, gener more generally to women. For example, in his Geneva lecture on the symptom, when fantasizing about the origin of language, Lacan suggests that women have actually invented it. Clearly, in making such claim, Lacan does not seek to articulate a historical truth about our human use of symbols, because already in his early works, Lacan had indicated that we actually cannot discover the origin of language. Yet, myth might help clarifying the structural reason as to why and how we speak the way we do. And this is what Lacan seems to believe when suggesting, when he suggests that women invented language. Specifically, the myth he points to is again taken from the biblical book Genesis. And here's the quote from Lacan. I would be inclined, he says, to believe that contrary to what shocks a lot of people, it's rather women who invented language. Moreover, this is what Genesis gives to understand. Women speak with the serpent, that is, with the phallus. They speak all the more with the phallus, given that it is hetero for them at that time. In this quote, Lacan suggests that as she talks to the snake in the Garden of Eden, Eve is actually addressing the phallus. Earlier in the same text, Lacan already made a reference to the phallus, indicating that the phallus 
concerns our relationship with the real of sexual jouissance and the issue of the deficient natural bond between both sexes. A feasible relationship with sexual jouissance can only be attained through speech. While speaking itself cannot ultimately, ultimately make sense of the sexual non rapport, uttering la langue helps us to avoid being overwhelmed by it. This is not only because la langue becomes a circuit of jouissance, it also installs the dimension of difference by discerning the figure of the addressee to which speech is addressed, hence the reference to the hetero, which means other in Greek, and to the serpent. Via the articulation of la langue, an external element that is different from the speaking being gets constituted. Characteristically, such addressing of the other obeys a phallic logic. It installs the promise or the hope that addressing the other will resolve our dissatisfaction with the jouissance popping up at the level of the sexual non rapport. This is also the role that the snake plays in Genesis. The serpent promises Eve that by eating the fruits of, of the forbidden tree, the human lack will be, revolved, will be resolved, and in the end, satisfaction will be obtained. In this view, speaking makes up a feminine strategy to swaddle the inherently foreign jouissance of the non rapport. Mythically, Eve, qua mother of all human beings, was the one who first engaged in such speech, thus opening a particular mode of behaving for her offspring. That is, jouissance needs to be addressed with la langue, which, in the same move, constitutes the dimension of the other, who is dressed up with phallic qualities. The function of the father, qua father of the name, needs to be conceptualized relative to this feminine use of speech and consists of making the transition from of la langue to common discourse. The father of the name concerns the Adamesque strategy in dealing with jouissance and consists of trying to make sense of the element one is affected by. After all, this is what Lacan suggests about Adam. He is the one who gives common names to the objects and events that make up the world. That is, he names things in such a way that they start functioning as shared realities. And in doing so, Adam makes a big leap and actually identifies with God. He assumes that things can be named correctly because God must have known what he did when creating the world. Consequently, his actions consist of copycatting what his guarantee already did in the first move. And again, a quote from the Geneva paper of the, on the symptom. It is very nicely evoked in Genesis, says Lacan, where there is all that mimicking of God who tells Adam to name the animals. Everything occurs as if there were two stages. God is supposed to know what names they are, since it's he who created them, supposedly. And then everything happens as if God wanted to put man to the test and see whether he knows how to mimic. Such Adam-like naming opens the universe of shared discourse, where signifiers no longer only embody a singular jouissance laden signification, but have, but have particular meanings. Such father of the name is operative when connecting an S2 to an S1. The result of this signifying move is that retroactive, retroactively, a concept or a signified gets pinned down. 
by linking S1 and S2, says Lacan, so-called seams take shape. That is, minimal semantic units by means of which meaning gets conveyed. Along this way, speech starts having a second life as it engenders the dimension of sense and knowledge. Clearly, this transition towards a semantic use of language maintains, maintains the defensive function that La Lange already had and serves the purpose of overcoming the sexual non rapport. This time, however, a veil of meanings will process that jouissance that is at stake. Within this view, la langue, la language is an elaboration of la langue. Thus the famous quote from seminar 20, la language, he says, is no doubt make, made up of la langue. It is knowledge's hair-brained lucubration about la langue, end of quote. Such inclusion of an S1 in the sense-making world of knowledge, S2, implies that jouissance not only circulates in the, resist, in the register of sound and musicality, but is linked to names that obtain meaning relative to other names. And this creates an enjoyment, says Lacan, related to meaning, which he calls semiotic jouissance, or enjoyment, jouissance, enjoyment. The underlying idea is that meaning-oriented speech implies a particular excitement that is generating by submerging oneself in the sea of signifieds that shared language entails. Apart from what is exactly being said, particular meanings, our focus on meaning as such entails a specific preoccupation that bears witness to a new enjoyment one might well get addicted to, hence the, ne the neologism enjoyment. Lacan's clarification about this type of jouissance is rather limited. In television, in television, he links enjoyment to punning. When making puns, we play with the ambiguity of meaning, and along this way, allude to different possible semantic connotations that might be associated with the equivocal expression. The pleasure produced by the anticipation and articulating of underlying sense that's enjoyment or enjoyed sense. More broadly, it could be said that this type of enjoyment plays an important role in the activity of deciphering as such. Deciphering such as taking place in psycholytic sessions. But it is an endless issue. Deciphering provides a particular gratification for the analysant and for the analyst, who might, both of them, become so wedded to it that psychoanalytic work tends to become an activity that never stops. Hence the problem of addiction to psychoanalytic deciphering and of interminability in psychoanalytic work. But if psychoanalytic work is successful, a change is to be expected at this level. All search for meaning makes up a further defensive reaction against the sexual non rapport that La Lange already addressed, hence the specific status of the symptom. In Lacan's later view, the symptom is the nonsensical remainder of the symptom, which persists despite all deciphering, thus pointing most directly to the issue of sexual non rapport. It names and treats the sexual non rapport without ending up in the field of shared sense. A symptom is idiosyncratic 
and senseless, but it has a naming function. To resume, I conclude that the father function entails three crucial facets, which I try to depict here, that all have to do with intergenerational transmission, and that can be situated in terms of the topological nothing of the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic. The name of the father, which are situated here, the name of the father is a first facet and refers to the socio-culturally embedded law and order attributed to the mother. Yet, the assumption that there is no other of the other makes clear that this law does not rest upon an ultimate touchstone, which implies that a name of the father refers to an act of faith, thanks to which attributing socio-culturally embedded laws is taken for granted. Not theoretically, the name of the father can be located at the interjunction of the real, which is the blue ring, and the green ring, which is the eye, the imaginary, where the symbolic, the red ring, creates a whole. At first, the mother manifests as a real or capricious imaginary instance, while at the same time serving as a basis of imaginary identification. The name of the father disrupts this jouissance-laden relationship, makes a hole in the intersection between the real and the imaginary by situating it relative to a symbolic law. The perversion that are situated here concerns a second facet of the father function. It presents a version as to how one might avoid being overwhelmed by jouissance and transform it in a yet to be attained surplus jouissance. Such perversion provides a way out of the deadlock of the sexual no rapport and creates a dimension beyond the desire of the mother. And topologically, the perversion can be situated at the intersection of the imaginary, the green ring, and the symbolic, the red ring. That this, at the level of meaning, by presenting a version of how to deal with jouissance, which is what the perversion does, a version of how to address the nonsensical real, the blue ring, emerging in all sense-mating activities is provided. The father of the name concerns a third aspect of the father function and implies a mode of addressing la langue and the close bond with the other that, it, that la langue implies. The father of the name consists of making the transition of feminine la langue to common discourse, which aims at making sense of elements one is affected by. And not theoretically, the father of the name can be situated at the intersection of the real, eh, which is the blue ring, and the symbolic, which is the red ring. La langue takes shape at the point where the real and the symbolic get intermingled. Yet, by naming what things are, which is what the father of the name does, imaginary consistency takes shape. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. So, questions and points of uh, discussion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
I wonder how you understand what you're doing, describing here, in terms of how Lacan understood himself describing Freud. Interpreting, developing, moving forward from. I think that these new concepts, perversion and father of the name, that in Lacan's and that in Lacan's interpretation of psychoanalysis, this has his move beyond Freud. So name of the father, you could say, is a Freudian concept. It's a Freudian, it's a, it's a formal translation of the Oedipus complex and sticks indeed to the Freudian model, whilst perversion and father of the name, I think, are completely new perspectives on the father function that were not yet introduced by Freud. And I think for people familiar with Anglo-Saxon psychoanalysis, this is also very surprising, perhaps. The way Lacan frames these other aspects of the father function, because you could say that some of when, what he calls father of the name, from an Anglo-Saxon perspective, would rather be attributed to the mother as an attachment figure, as an attachment figure, who speaks with the child and includes the child in some kind of bond. I think Lacan is attributing that part to the father, as father of the name. But these are all perspectives beyond Freud. Just like you could say that the Anglo-Saxon attachment perspective was addressing something that was not in Freud, I think Lacan is also addressing something that is not in Freud, but in his view is quite crucial uh, to understand how a father might function for a, a person. And what are you doing? Excuse me? And what are you doing? What am I doing? Yeah, today, in terms of all that you've described and that you've described of Well, uh, my idea was that um, Lacan obviously never theorized the idea of the father function in a systematic way in his later work. He sometimes says something about the father, but in a very fragmented way. What I did, I, I uh, spent a couple of years doing cartels with my group in Ghent, starting with seminar 18, and now we finished 20, 24. Very detailed reading, and I focused on what does Lacan actually say about the father? Because there is not, not so much consistency in it. And I try to figure out what the consistency might be. And so therefore I see this three functions of a father figure, which all concern a different aspect of the Borromean nothing uh, between the rings. And actually he's addressing components that you cannot understand with the classic idea of the name of the father. And I, th I think this is very relevant because this is how I see that fathers nowadays function for their children. Sometimes there is a complaint that authority is declining in the Western world. So the paternal function is disappearing. I'm not so pessimistic about it. And I think that Lacan, with his other ideas of the perversion and the father of the name, invites psychoanalysts to see that fathers can be used in many, many ways. And that classic authority and that classic structure, such as articulated by cultures that are functioning as closed systems, there are many ways beyond that. And so therefore, we shouldn't be pessimistic as psychoanalysts because of the fact that the father function is more than incorporating culture and transmitting culture from one generation to another, and so reproducing things. The, the, two, the two other aspects of the father function, father function refer to more the vivid father who invents as a singular artificer, but in the same way, 
might provide a model or an anti-model for his offspring. And this, in my view, is something new that was not at all in Freudian psychoanalysis. Sabu Rastanji has a question, and then Kate, please. Um, Maybe if you can repeat the question. Stay there, and he'll repeat the question. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering whether Lacan had any idea of um, the relationship between human consciousness and the because of Ganesha. You know the story of Ganesha. Well, the question is... Can you tell you quickly? Yeah. yeah. But then it's maybe better that you yeah. speak to the mic because... Over Just like? Uh, yeah, there. the microphone there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Parvati was a Hindu goddess and she was with her husband and the husband used to go for warfare all the time with neighboring states so he was a warrior and Parvati got very sad and disappointed that she didn't have a husband because he was always fighting with other tribes so she one day out of sheer desperation because she's a goddess she could easily manufacture children so there are many versions of how she manufactured Kanpati she, one version is that she took the soap, some soap in her hands and rubbed it together and out came a baby. And there are lots of versions how she manufactured it effortlessly. And then she loved the baby and the baby loved her. And the baby was there to protect her and the baby took on the father's role of always standing outside her bedroom to protect her, that nobody trans transgressed that protection. And suddenly one day the father came in after winning or whatever and um, he saw this boy and he thought what a horrible boy uh, he is whatever he thought that he is having something to do with my wife and so he said to his horse his his tribe his people his warriors to kill him so they killed the boy and once they killed him um, Parvati heard the sounds the mother and she came running and she was berserk with mourning and she, she was absolutely berserk and uh, the father felt very bad about it and he told the warriors that go to the forest and get the first uh, head of the first animal you see and I'll sew it up together because he's also a god he could sew up people with the top of a hat mm -hmm. <laughs> so they went and they got an elephant's head and they, he sewed it up. And uh, Ganesha is revered in Hindu religion. Not in any other religions, but in Hindu religion. And there's a ceremony for him every year where his body is put into the water and goes for a swim. Every accountant has this uh, 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 a sample of Ganesha with a long mm -hmm. task and all that. And um, then his father thought he would help Ganesha what to eat, what not to eat. So he sort of took on some maternal uh, jobs and he would tell him to wear a string, like Hindu, Hindu Brahmins wear a string here on their waist so that if they eat too much it will break and things like that. And what, what to eat, what not to eat, how to talk, how not to talk, what the moon does. I mean, he, he taught him a lot. Mm -hmm. like a father would and um, and this is, this is the story of that now Muslims have a different attitude um, this is the Hindu story mm -hmm. the whole of India has a holiday on Ganpati day mm -hmm. um, and we all loved it um, so the issue is about how you relate this to um, well the, the one thing is clear that um, as long as, as far as I know, Lacan never um, discussed myths or stories from Hinduism. Um, and you could say indeed that his theory is quite attuned to the people that he saw in his practice. Um, the Western perspective in that respect, you could say, 
prevails in his perspective of psychoanalysis. But at the same time, he turns to the East, but then more to, uh, to Chinese culture. This is not Chinese. No, no, I know. But Lacan is more, when he discusses influences from the East, it's more, he's more directed towards but you say it's Chinese. Between Russia and Chinese. Um, I, I wouldn't know that. I'm just saying that in, in terms of Lacan, he, when, when he discusses Eastern influences, he's more oriented towards China rather. He must have gone to China more often. Well, it's not really that he went there quite often, but you could say that um, also in Paris at that time, there was a huge influence of, of Chinese scholars, and he was quite interested in Chinese writing, uh, and which interested him at a certain point was the fact that um, the movement of writing uh, which, and I think he connects it, uh, that his fascination for the Chinese writing and the characters is related to his interest in La Langue, and that it, it has something to do with the body, the body expressing something very quickly, and then it is there. Um, that the, and he connects it to the dimension of the letter, the letter as the physical thing that is drawn beyond the meaning attributed to the latter when it's when it's introduced and in, in, introduced in the signifying chain and i think at that point he goes looking for inspiration in in the east but then especially in more in in in, in chinese uh thinking rather than in, in in hinduism or in indian um perspectives okay uh so i think you uh, don't you don't know about the muslims no uh, we might move yeah, on to Okay. Yeah. You don't know better. Yeah. Going to Ganesha, but, uh, first, I mean, three points. Just very quick points. One is, uh, I, I think what she's uh, talking about is about the cultural relativism of the pertinent functions. Yeah. And absolutely, this is an anthropological and, uh, as far as I remember, so the Gakkar and Gananat care, they have pointed out to a different different logic of Oedipus resolution, mm -hmm. particularly in the South Asian culture, Indian culture. So it might be different from the West. It could be. Mm -hmm. Though I think that the Lacanian uh, formulation is more of a universalistic nature and then circumscribing the cultural difference within the universalizing uh, notion, like what Freud possibly, but there are very interesting negotiations with Freud and some people of speaking of other, other Oedipuses. Uh, uh, this one. Number two, what you say, it's very interesting in the sense that uh, we know that the paternal function and uh, how to relate this, your conception of three uh, modalities with, as you say just now, with the lit capitalism and the decline of the father functions and, well, even the Frankfurt reacted to that, mm -hmm. he's reacted to that at the death of the father, death of the authoritarian father gives rise to an ultra conformism Mm -hmm. and absolutely giving way to the absence of any rebellious objectivity or the simply absence of the paternal function giving rise to the silent and conformist subject. So how, how will you place with that? And next is since uh, it's my, it's my, uh, it's, I was just pondering whether what you said about do that really supply anything, the role of the father to some kind of critique or critical theory. Uh, uh, the, the role of the diversification of the paternal functions other than the authoritarian, possibly the 68 pointed to that, uh, mm -hmm. Lacan was writing uh, after the 68. And just to carry over from her about the Hindu tradition, interestingly, the whole tantric tradition, which is, uh, it was in Bengal and India, tantric, absolutely, it, it's based on a ritual intercourse with the mother. The whole tradition, we have a text on that. Uh, the, 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 what the tantras, the, the, the disciples do is ritual intercourse. And in that particular religious worship, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ritual intercourse with a mother, I mean, mother goddess. So that is something embodied in the tantric practices. And just was pondering whether how come the maternal and the real and everything uh, the two into that where a disciple is already engaging in quite a activity 
with her own ma rather than the presence of the paternal function in that particular religious discourse. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That was interesting. Um, now, the first aspect concerning the the, the critical um, perspective, I personally think that the notion of the perversion might uh, function as a critical concept uh, relative to capitalist discourse. That, 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 that's a bit what I try to explain. I think that um, this way of functioning um, that responds to, in a culture where the law and the forbidding of the father is not so much the rule, but the seduction of customers by market economy is the rule, in this context, I think the perversion is a perversion of capitalism because it plays, you could say, with some similar parameters, but um, it doesn't lead to consumption. It, uh, it installs something of a lack within uh, a culture of seduction and it promises hope and things like that. Um, and yeah, so therefore I think that we might examine in cultures where practices of perversion arise. Uh, and I think that in, in that respect, we will, end, we will end up also studying like how subcultures, subcultures with specific own practices on how to deal with one another and why we deal with each other in that way is like a perversion. And for example, like you could say, like you have, you have vegans uh, and this is a subculture, and this is a way of dealing with the body, and this is a kind of an inspiration that is transmitted by figures who are convinced that veganism is an alternative to the world. So they are selling a perspective to people who might be interested in that, so there is a kind of seduction playing, but at the same time, people attracted to the subculture will kind of break away from capitalism. And along that way, we see many, many little subcultures that, um, yeah, that just get created and that get reinforced via, via, via the internet. And I would say these are like perversions. Uh, and why are these perversions? Because um, they also formulate an alternative, a third point, a way out of something. And in this case, a way out of the the deadlock that is implied in capitalism, where there is indeed a promise of jouissance, but as Lacan says, it leads to the consumption of the subject. The subject becomes mad and gets consumed by the capitalist system. So therefore, we need a perversion, and subcultures might be a perversion uh, that don't rely on classic forbidding rules from traditional culture, but that nonetheless get created as some alternatives by, by, by smaller communities that unite across the world. Okay. I actually just had a comment that, um, I think it's incredibly speak, speak. Um, My comment was just uh, that I think it's a very beautiful and elegant um, ordering of the aspects of the function of the father. And that um, I look forward to looking at it in more detail, but the two things that occur to me are it really makes very clear by putting them in those places in the forum and not, how we draw on those different aspects working to, um, let's say, support the function of the father in family instances or clinically where something is not working and that where the authoritarian injunction of the, name, the classic name of the fatherism so prevalent today, it is exactly these other two. Yeah. That explained yeah. what's mm -hmm. happening. So that was uh, the way I heard this talk, but it's a, a very elegant uh, mapping of it. And so <clears throat> I guess in terms of questions, I wondered where, um, in terms, you know, where, where the St. Thomas, if we think about the St. Thomas of fourth not him, how that fits in there. And also when Lacan talks about the pluralization of the names of the father, uh, you know, that aspect of thinking of the function of the father in different aspects, um, how that... Anyway. Yeah, well, I think the pluralization of the name of the father, of the pluralization of the father, this is the symbolic. Yeah. yeah. And first we need the pluralization, and the pluralization means there is no other of the other. 
So the father is not all in the symbolic. That's the pluralization. Yes, but isn't it like a, a transitional move to... I think so. To, to yeah. Exactly yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, indeed, I believe that for the contemporary clinic that we see uh, in the, clinic, the contemporary clinic of neurosis, um, we indeed see people functioning, and there is some kind of symbolic father figure, but this figure is not that orienting, so therefore they look for other alternatives. And this is more the game that is played, so the father function might be occupied, for example, like I said, by, by a subculture, uh, rather than by a concrete father figure in a family. And along that way, it does provide um, a way out for a person to function. So it's always a triangulation. And the question about the Santom, I think that the Santom creation in psychoanalysis implies a breakaway from all three modalities of the father function, that this is a Santom creation. So when is a Santom created? It is when a person in organizing his jubisance is no longer like taking some perversion Perversion as the ultimate example. Oh, this is how jouissance needs to be lived. Okay, but it's not necessarily going to waste. But someone has moved through. Because the way I hear it is that everyone would move through those facets yeah, yeah, yeah. in some way. And it's the distillation of that that would be a Santom in a general sense, as distinct from uh, like a Joycean sense. Yeah. It's a distinction. Yeah. But for me, the Santom is always something singular. Yeah. It's not shared with one another, no. whilst the perversion, it's an attempt to be in a shared kind of practice. So what is a symptom? It's assuming your private practice in Jubisance. Exactly. And that's, it does not exclude the, the perversion, but symptom creation is... A distillation. Uh, yeah, a distillation and also like a move away. It's, it's giving up the ambition that an external solution would be there for you. Yeah. But that, the way you spell out those three aspects of the function further, I think really makes it very clear how everybody does a formation yeah. with regard to that in yeah. order to yeah. process it into the distillation of a singular symptom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think indeed, in, in case of neurosis, this is how we should think of the symptom. The symptom is the creation of a singular answer to the problems that are generally answered via these three aspects of the father function, that this is symptom creation in case of neurosis. Yeah. And a question that myself I'm wondering about is that when conceptualized along that way, what is foreclosure exactly? Is foreclosure only the name of the father or is foreclosure also perversion, that, is, that there is no guiding inspiration around you, and also maybe the, the father of the name, meaning that there is a loss of a feeling of common meanings between people. And but maybe it's there, because if you think of the, your function in a case to present it is, yeah. there's a pacifying function described in your um, practical suggestions for things around the house. There's a, a naming, you're naming something there in a way that uh, has an effect. Yeah. Well, it, I, I certainly think that stabilization and psychosis will play on those three. Uh, either you get uh, the delusion, the delusional metaphor. That's Lacan's first theory about psychosis and stabilization. It's an alternative to the name of the father. The question is, what is the alternative? to a perversion, uh, what is an alternative to the father of the name in psychosis? And uh, maybe Joyce is, 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 provides us one way of, of answering this question, um, because he does his own thing with La Langue and plays with the semantics of language. Uh, so he is kind of creating his ego around this play with La Langue. Um, so this is, I think, Joyce, it gives another perspective on foreclosure that is not that he that there Lacan is looking for a stabilization that has not to do with an alternative to the to the name of the father. Thanks, Dan. Um, just 
echoing Kate. I really appreciate the paper and the amount of work you've put into clarifying those three functions. That um, yeah, that's really helped me a lot to understand um, earlier seminars in context as well. Um, I kind of have two questions mixed up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still thinking about how to articulate it. Um, and at the risk of naming Christian concepts, um, faith, hope, and love. Um, in relation to the name of the Father, you spoke about how an act of faith is needed to elevate the enigma. And in relation to par, um, per, per version, you, you quoted the kind of seminar 23 on um, the Father as deserving love and respect. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so with relation to um, Per Version, you gave an example of veganism as a, as a, uh, a micro subculture. Mm -hmm. It's actually now being taken up by capitalist discourse as we see in supermarkets everywhere, but mm -hmm. still the momentum of that as an example. And I'm wondering, um, so this is the more specific question, in relation to naming um, the father of the name, I'm wondering if you can give some kind of example of that as well, or do you think it pertains mainly to um, each and every Santon? You know, you, you spoke about feeling hope mm -hmm. um, and, and you're optimistic um, about the multiple ways of and diversifying the roles of the, the mother and father functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm also thinking of Taoism here too, in relation to Lacan, in terms of this multiplication of the way. Yep. So yeah, I'm just wondering, yeah, I'm just wondering what you think about in terms of that of the um, of the ideas of love, faith and hope in Lacanian thinking. And more specifically, is there an example around naming in terms of the father of the name? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's interesting what you say about these three Catholic principles, Christian principles, you could say. But I think more broadly, um, these, of course, refer to the fact that there is mental life, that there is what Lacan calls mentalité that there is a mental life. So meaning that there is a space where something can be thought that is not there. And hope, love, faith is something that we presume as crucial yeah. in the mental atmosphere. But to create such a mental atmosphere, I think these, these aspects of the father function are needed. Or is St. Thomas an alternative uh, to that? Um, and then your question about a specific example of the a father of the name, I think there it's more global, um, meaning that as long as people believe, like we in part here do, that we will communicate meanings to one another and that the solution is to be found at the level of meaning that one day we will know, that we will know how things really are, that's the, the playing of the father of the name. It's the anticipation that something relevant will be produced and will be set through this course. And psychoanalysis kind of disrupts this belief in, in an analysant. Uh, because the analysant discovers like the deadlock of his search for meaning. And this is the, the, the point at which Lalonde enters in, 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 in in the psycholytic theorizing, mm -hmm. like you discover like indeed that you're speaking to, to nothing, that you're barking, and an analysis is barking into the sky. And uh, actually it's, it's indeed, it's, it's, it's an activity of vocalizing. And obviously that becomes the point. And that is more crucial. And this is hidden away by the fact that we think that we communicate relevant things. Uh, the semiotic. Yeah, so. this is a semiotic jouissance. So in this respect, it's more global. Right. It's the global illusion that we all have that we communicate semantically relevant um, elements to one another and that the clue is to be found there. Uh, so breaking away from it is, in the first instance, assuming the, the working of, of Lalande, but then again also seeing 
why do I, as a speaking being, bark to the sky, so to speak? Is because something moves me. And what is it that moves me? It is the non rapport. Where do analysants speak about when they come to sessions? About their children, their partner, their mother, their father. Uh, it's always the same. Uh, so at the level of content, nothing new is to be discovered. And at the level of our language, we see that people are moved by their own speech about it. But the, the thing is that it's their way of dealing with the fact that there is no unity, that there is no connection with the mother, that there is no connection with the father, there is no connection with the partner, and there is no connection um, with, with your own body and your own life. And you have to deal with it. Um, so breaking or, or uh, the, the father of the name is touched when people give up the idea that we can gain insight and knowledge about these specific facts. Um, I too have the same question often, you know, why do I bark at this guy? <laughs> <laughs> last question, uh, I'm sorry, we'll have to finish with this last question from Joanna. Mm. Uh, thank you, Sting. Um, with, in regards to the crying of the name of the father, because from uh, my understanding and what I was reading in uh, literature, that the name of the father has sort of a uh, thousands of years history in a symbolic, strictly symbolic way, like Schreber's delusion, you know, is like very complicated, elaborated um, tale, which takes a lot of metaphorical work. And, um, and in, so in that way, uh, Eric Laurent calls the name of the father, you know, it's a metaphor who uh, lets us, you know, come starting from a drive goes to the love, you know, not the other way around. And um, so I was thinking that name of the father declines in the way of, you know, this elaborate metaphor. And, and because it declines in that way, it uh, actually brings the authority of the father with the big F Mm -hmm. to the ground and give, give rise to all the extremism or the prohibition. And even in the Freudian field, they say that, you know, it will happen in America. And, you know, the sort of uh, Freudian teaching was neglected and was psychologized and put into some sort of authority that they took Freud as their father. And, you know, it, it, or, or bad things can come out from that. Uh, and also, you know, uh, when Freud, uh, Lacan refers to, you know, to, to the quote from Dostoevsky saying, you know, because Dostoevsky said, once there's God dead, everything's alive. Lacan reverses it, you know, when the God is dead, nothing's allowed. So, you know, so sort of all the extreme movements and all the extremists and the, the rise of authority in the current social order. It, I see it as a sort of result of the climb of that, you know, metaphorical work. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. And then the question becomes how to analyze these new cultural phenomena. Uh, and I think that extremism, we might both see it as an alternative, a delusional alternative to the name of the father, because I think many extremist theories, they are built on madness. And so it's not the law as a guiding principle, but then you have a delusional system that explains the things. It's an alternative to it. But on the other hand, ex extremism, you could say it's a perversion, because it's a way of it's prescribing how to deal with your body, how to deal with other people, how to deal with the sexual relationship, how to deal in parenthood. Um, because these, of course, might function in, an, in a dogmatic way, and then you just have, uh, instead of being uh, locked up, as used to be the case um, in Freud's era, under the, in the name of the father, in a strict culture that is based on rules and laws that you have to obey, and that are transmitted across generations, Within a perversion like uh, environment, you also might discover a new kind of terror that is formulated by such a perspective. Uh, so it's not that, uh, that a perversion, I, I give the example of veganism, which you could say, yeah, it's, 
it's, it's a pleasant example because it's you yourself who makes the choice. Um, within extremist cultures, you might also see that uh, a certain way of enjoying is um, imposed onto people. And then it's more like the question is working in a clinical context with such persons, how to break away from a perversion rather than how to move away from um, the dictates of the father that are based on the law. Uh, so I think some of our future work in psychoanalysis will have to do with these subjects, people who escape, for example, from the prison of a perversion and come to us hopeless and with nothing and with no other perspective for living life, except for the fact that they don't want this prison of, of this perversion where they come from. Uh, so I think that also there, the, the concept of the perversion might help us to interpret these new cultural phenomena of extremism, but also of subcultures uh, that are being organized, and some of which you, you, you make a choice, others you don't choose for it, or they are imposed. But it gives us a broader, more concepts to kind of theorize this field. Uh, and just starting from the idea of the decline of the father function, it's, it's not enough because that's only a negative definition. Uh, and it gives the wrong impression that the solution would be in a reinstallment of the, of, of, of the symbolic father function. And I don't think the solution is there. Mm. I just have to announce something tonight, but before I do, I'd like um, you to join me in showing appreciation for uh, the stand for bringing to us this really original and uh, recent work, these reflections of yours, and uh, generously sharing them with us today. Yeah.